Howdy, our group is presenting liver regeneration scaffold, where group four and our group members are Emily Nelson, Ines Abramson, Ashley Kadenek, Sarah Matt, uh, Ms. Albacillo, Rachel Infante, Roni Threddy, and Roman Krolikowski. To start off, the liver is the largest organ in the body and serves a variety of vital purposes. It's essential for digestion as well as metabolism, detoxifying, controlling blood sugar levels, and producing bile. Additionally, the liver produces vital proteins and stores a number of vitamins and minerals. The liver is made up of lobules, which are functional units, and the hepatic, hepatic scaffolding, which is connective tissue. The hepatic scaffolding supports the liver structurally and aids in preserving the liver's form and functionality. When blood sugar levels are directed by the liver, it stores extra glucose as glycogen and releases it when the body requires it. So when the liver gets damaged as a result of liver disease, it'll allow, it'll affect how it well it functions. The liver function can be impacted by diseases such as cohorus, fatty liver disease, and hepatitis. These diseases could end up in chronic liver failure, which would result in the patient requiring either a partial or even full liver transplant possible to only take part of the liver from a donor thanks to the liver's ability to regenerate itself from as little as 10% of its mass. This characteristic of the liver could potentially be used in order to treat a patient's liver failure without the need for a separate and medical donor. So what are our current treatment options? Traditional liver transplants are the main treatment option for different types of liver failure that our group members have mentioned. And their survival rates, according to the NIH right now, are 86% after one year, 78% after three, and 72% after five years. Most of the other treatments are still in testing phases and have not been approved for widely for wide use across different hospitals and clinics. So first of all, traditional transplant has obviously risks involved with the surgery, additional risks associated with have to first of all accept the liver and then have to take anti-rejection medicine for long periods of time after this and the main problem with this is that there is no liver availability currently uh, then there is the other option of a living donor transplant which has all the same associated risks of surgery and rejection applied to it and the biggest pro of it is that normally patients that have a living donor transplant stay in the hospital for shorter times than deceased donor transplants, but it is really hard to find a match that is willing to donate and go the, undergo the surgery that they need to donate. Then for other types of smaller um, cover liver failures, there's lifestyle modifications where just uh, alcohol ingestion and changed diets to lose weight are applied, and it depends on the condition. And some upcoming treatments is liver on a chip, scaffolding, which is our main topic, and stem cell therapy, bioartificial livers, xenotransplantation, and hepatocyte transplantation. So current research that is now being applied, the first research that was looked at was um, uh, nutrients that aid in nourishing the liver's health, such as vitamin K2 and vitamin A. And both of these come from eating the actual liver itself, which is done from, uh, by eating the liver of other animals. And vitamin K2 is a vitamin that's most abundant in the liver itself, and it helps activate other uh, vitamins. It also helps with the recovery of the liver function, such as what happens with cirrhosis. And then vitamin A helps in maintaining the integrity of the liver cells, as well as helps get rid of harmful substances. And then the second research that was uh, looked at was the cells that help maintain the liver's health as well as helping uh, repair the liver. Um, a uh, research that is done by UT Southwestern Medical Center um, had fluorescent markers on, on different cells on the liver and they put the liver cells uh, under different uh, circumstances and what was found was that the hepatocytes were, uh, were the ones that responded the most to this. And then lastly, the last research that was looked at was scaffold, which is what the group itself is tackling. And what was looked at was different uh, biomaterials were used in this research to look at what serves the best for scaffolding. One of the biomaterials that was used was cellulose, which is found in plants. 
Uh, and an issue with this is it cannot be degraded by the human body as well as it can cause damage to the liver itself. Um, and then other important properties that are needed for scaffold is the porosity, the shape, and stiffness. So for the approach and the details of the design, we used a series of steps to approach this problem, starting with researching the issue at hand, where we looked up the different enzymes, molecules, cells, and hormones that are involved in the liver's natural regeneration process. We discovered that hepatocytes are the main cell used in regeneration, more so than stem cells. We also discovered that there are two growth factors that speed up regeneration, including hepatocyte growth factor and epidermal growth factor. We then looked into other beneficial regenerative properties, including other stem cells from other studies that have been proven to aid in regeneration in other devices. Stem cells from the spleen are some of these with really good regenerative properties. We then looked up past projects used to aid in regeneration and decided that building a scaffold would likely produce the best results. Past that, we looked more into regenerative scaffolds and things needed to build one and help it to function and be viable within the body. So for the scaffold to survive, it would need to be surrounded by a solution of nutrients and would need access to a supply of blood and oxygen. Next, we looked into how to combine everything to ensure optimal regeneration of the liver. In designing our product, we decided to make the scaffold out of isolated stem cells from the spleen. Then there would be a solution composed of all the nutrients, hep hepatocytes, and growth factors surrounding the scaffold. And the veins and arteries of the liver would be surgically attached to the scaffold to permit blood flow and access to oxygen. So while we were designing, we came up with five major hurdles. Obviously, throughout the design process, we would encounter more, but these are uh, the these are the major ones that we saw needed to be overcome. The first one being the vasculature and the blood supply of this scaffold. So we need to find a way to provide our scaffold with consistent blood supply since it will contain living cells and also make sure that it connects with the extracellular matrix since there are complex interactions that occur between liver cells themselves. And that's just basically because the scaffold itself doesn't have a vasculature going in and we need to attach it to vasculature somewhere or find another solution. Uh, second one would be the bile system connection. That's obviously because it's an essential process within the body and uh, the blood supply that's then connecting to the scaffold and flowing through that and throughout the entire liver regeneration process, we need to make sure that that blood is filtered properly. Um, the third one would be the hepatocyte viability for implantation. So depending on the severity of the liver damage, there may be no viable hepatocytes left to work with. So we may need to find another source or synthesize primary hepatocytes, ideally either in vitro or from spleen cells. And then to decrease this risk of rejection, these would preferably come from the patient. Um, the fourth one would be avoiding the diffusion of materials apart from the liver cells. And that's just making sure that all the vitamins and the cells contained within the scaffold don't leak out and don't diffuse away and actually affect the liver regeneration. And then the fifth one is finally, how will it be implanted? So that's basically, do we need to come up with another method for implantation? Do we need to, uh, um, do we need to educate surgeons on how to implant it properly? And then a major factor is also the time. So the studies that we looked at for this um, idea was based off of pig livers and it showed that they were only viable for about 24 hours after creation. So that may cause potential issues in the future. So to address one of those questions that we have, how do we keep these growth factors from diffusing away from our scaffold? The main strategy that we would like to employ is something called micro nanoparticle embedding which is where you take the growth factor, you embed it into these micro nanoparticles, and then you seed these particles throughout your scaffold, in our case, once the spleen cells have been decellularized. So there are two methods to do this. We have, first of all, natural biomaterials, something like collagen, dextran, or chitazan. 
And now these are going to have better biocompatibility and biodegradability. Obviously, if it's something natural that the body's familiar with, it's less likely to reject it. It also has good hydrophilicity. So these growth factors are going to be hydrophilic. And with a biomaterial that is also hydrophilic, it can absorb it a little bit better. These also have a really great advantage of being able to not just let these growth factors diffuse out, but sustainably release them to the cells within our scaffold for nearly 30 days. The downside is that these do have bad batch repeatability and are difficult to synthesize in a lab. Additionally, the hydrophilicity can be a problem if it's not going to keep the growth factors within, if it's going to let it diffuse away because it's hydrophilic. Another option that would be better is something called polylactic co-glycolic acid, or PLGA for short. And that's going to be a synthetic material, but it still has really good biocompatibility because it's often seen in other tissue regeneration scaffolds. So the good thing about PLGA is that it has really good repeatability in a lab. It has this intrinsic viscosity and hydrophobicity that's going to help keep these growth factors within the scaffold and not let them diffuse out. And its sustained release can last up to 42 days, which would give our liver cells more time to proliferate. And it has a more tunable, adjustable shape, which can affect how effective it is and how long it lets these growth factors diffuse out. So another question we have to answer is, how do we encourage vascularization of the scaffold? Uh, since the scaffold itself will be decellularized, there will not be any endothelial cells uh, lining the vasculature of the scaffold. So when pumping blood in, it will encounter the extracellular fluid, which can cause the blood to coagulate and cause blood clots and a lot of problems. So one potential solution to that is to encourage vascularization before implantation of the scaffolding. Uh, using stem cells and in vivo growth methods, the scaffold could be partially cellularized before implantation. This would enable the scaffold to immediately connect to the body's blood supply upon implantation. Another possible solution is uh, using a heparin gelatin mixture, coating the pre-existing vascular structure within the scaffolding without recellularizing it would allow blood to flow through that pre-existing uh, vasculature structure without encountering those coagulating proteins in the extracellular matrix. This coating also still allows for the diffusion of nutrients to the stem cells and hepatocytes working to recellularize the scaffold. And here's the references. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.